Yeah? Okay, great. Um, all right, uh, so it's 1.30, so uh, I'm going to get started. Um, my name is Aya Sayed. I, am, um, I work at Bloomberg. I am Egyptian, uh, but I've lived in three different continents. I'm currently based in London. Um, I am also, I speak two languages, and I'm learning uh, the third, which is French. Um, if any of you speak French or you've successfully taught yourself a language, please <laughs> speak to me after, because I'm very interested to hear your tips. Okay, uh, so Bloomberg, you probably um, heard of us. We're one of the main sponsors of this conference. Um, if you haven't, please um, come visit our booth. Uh, we love Python. We're, uh, we've invested in Python. And um, yeah, we, we are lucky to have some of the uh, big names <laughs> working at Bloomberg, like uh, Pablo Galindo. Um, yeah, uh, we've also, you may have heard of like some of the Python open source tools that we've, um, uh, that we've provided, that we've open sourced recently. Uh, Memory was very well received by the Python community. There's also a more recent one, uh, PyStack. Uh, if you want to learn more, um, yeah, come visit the booth. Okay. So um, today, yeah, we're going to talk to you about, or it's just me today because uh, I was supposed to have a co-speaker, uh, but unfortunately he couldn't uh, make it because the visa wait times, uh, apparently, for uh, the US visas are crazy now, and unfortunately he couldn't get an appointment on time. So um, it's just going to be me today. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm going to talk to you about SQL Alchemy. Um, we want to show you how SQL Alchemy can simplify your code, make it more succinct, uh, readable, maintainable, um, or in short, more Pythonic. Um, I like this uh, definition here from Audacity. It says, Pythonic describes a coding style that leverages Python's unique features to write code that is readable and beautiful. Um, so we're going to be doing that to our um, service today. We have an example service that we're going to be working on throughout this tutorial. It's going to be a very hands-on tutorial. Uh, so we're, we're all going to be using our uh, laptops today. Um, we're going to do, um, we're going to see how to use SQL Alchemy in two services. Um, there is a first, the synchronous service, and then we're going to um, also see how to use it in an asynchronous service. So, um, yeah, and if you don't know async IO, don't worry about it. Uh, we're also going to be doing a quick um, rundown of some exercises uh, that will help kind of like cover the basics of async IO so you, you can follow along uh, the rest of the workshop. Um, basically, there are two kind of uh, main layers. There is the core layer and there is the ORM layer. So the core layer is where um, uh, the engine, which is like the key uh, component that allows us to connect a database, lives. Um, it does two things. It manages the connection pooling and it also uh, kind of abstracts away uh, what, um, you know, how we can interact with the database. So for example, here in, in this workshop, we're going to be using uh, SQLite. We're going to tell it what uh, dialect. So we're going to be telling the engine what dialect we want to use. So that's SQLite. And what DB API we want to use. So that's the specific um, interface that we're going to use to connect to a database. Um, in the um, synchronous version of the service, we're going to be using one DB API. And when we switch over to the asynchronous version, you'll see a different DB API. Um, but SQL Alchemy Score also provides um, uh, other things like the SQL expression language. Uh, we're going to be uh, seeing how to use that and how it, uh, how it makes our code a lot more succinct. Um, we'll also uh, be looking at using object relational mappers. So that's the top layer there. It will also help us make our code a lot more um, you know, object oriented, a lot more um, manageable so that we're not writing like raw SQL strings and trying to manage those. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to skip over that because it's uh, more of the details that I just covered and we want to stay on time. But uh, just to get you excited about uh, what we're going to be covering today, you can see this bulky raw SQL query here that, um, you know, it, it's, it's making a select, it's doing some joins and, you know, you can see how like this is kind of like hard to read, hard to manage, it's easy to make a mistake. Um, and after we apply ORMs and we use the SQL expression language, our query can just look like this. It's a lot more uh, succinct, a lot more um, readable, a lot more 
a lot less error prone as well. Um, yeah, so SQL Alchemy also uh, supports a number of um, databases. So you know you can use um, uh, whichever database you want, and these are some of the major ones, uh, including uh, I'll point out Bloomberg's ComDB2 here. Um, yeah, some advantages is that you don't have to do like these raw and bulky uh, SQL queries anymore. Um, it helps prevent um, SQL injection attacks. Um, it also makes database migration a lot easier. Because you're not uh, directly accessing the database, you have this abstraction layer between your business logic and the database so that you can, if you wanted to migrate databases, you don't have to change um, your queries or your database management logic because SQL Alchemy sits between uh, your business logic and the actual database. Um, yeah, um, also the, the core features are separate for, from the ORM, so you can use as much or as little um, features from SQL Alchemy as you want. Um, there are different uh, loading strategies that ship with SQL Alchemy, so you can optimize performance to your uh, specific use case. We're gonna be covering some loading strategies today. And uh, yeah, it makes it easier as well to like test uh, your SQL queries. So life just becomes easier. Um, right, so we're gonna be um, using an example service today. It's a Python microservice using uh, Fast API. Um, mainly there is a, okay, I'll talk about the contents of the you know, specific code um, when I show, when we move on to the hands-on part. Uh, but yeah, uh, there's, it's basically a Flask, uh, sorry, a Fast API microservice that manages a SQLite database we also have a version of this um, tutorial that uh, uses Postgres, so if you're interested, uh, you can also have a look at that. But today we're gonna be using uh, SQLite just to kind of minimize the load on the conference internet today. Um, so some examples of queries that this service does. It's a marketplace service, so there are customers and orders, and um, you know they can place orders, so you can make a query like get customers, get the orders of a customer, get the total cost of an order, get orders between two days, and add a new order. Um, and then this is what the database looks like. So we have the customer table. Uh, a customer can have an address, so that's a one-to-one -one relationship here. A customer can place an order, multiple orders, so that's a one-to-many relationship. And then orders, um, a given order contains multiple items, and um, the order items um, table just represents like which order am I a part of, which item, and how, how like the quantity of the items that were purchased as part of that order. And then finally, we have this um, you know uh, repository of items that are available to purchase. Um, yeah, so we wanted to kind of like show multiple um, relationship examples so we can see uh, different optimization techniques as we go along. Um, okay, so now it's time to actually uh, get started. Um, I suggest you just follow the second tiny URL link because from that you can just get um, the, the, the first link there. So just go to tinyurl.com slash sqlalchemy dash tutorial and that will open up um, the uh, tutorial instructions here. Um, okay. So that is tinyurl.com slash SQL Alchemy dash tutorial. Okay, uh, hopefully everyone got a chance to open the link. Um, okay, so uh, let's get started. So first we're gonna be using um, GitHub Code Spaces today. Um, on GitHub Code Spaces, we're gonna, you know, it's gonna have Python 3.12. We wanna use the latest uh, Python. And um, don't worry about like the rest of it. We're gonna be installing things as we go along. Um, so what you want to do um, is visit the example repo. There is a link to it here. And then um, the instructions are written out, but I will show you. Um, you want to um, open up this link, create a fork, so I'm gonna hit create a new fork. Um, and I will not select, this is important, so I will not select the option copy the, the main branch only. 
This is because we've uh, set up a few branches for you for every step here. So that if you, um, if you want to kind of uh, take a sneak peek at like what the solution is for that step, or, you know, uh, or you're just, I don't know, too lazy to like write out all the code yourself, you can always check out the next step and just continue from there. Um, yeah, so I will uncheck this, um, and then I will hit create fork, and that will create my fork for me. Uh, and then once I have my fork, I will uh, click on um, this button here that says code. And on the code spaces tab, I'll ask it to create a code space for me on main. Okay, uh, I'll let it do that. Um, while it's building my code space, uh, we're gonna be creating a Python virtual environment um, where we're gonna be installing the dependencies that we need as we go along. Um, of course, here, because we're working on code spaces, this really doesn't add that much value, but if you were working, um, say, locally or some other host that is um, shared by different projects, then it's good practice to create um, a virtual environment for your project. Uh, so we're gonna be doing that. So to do that, um, you can uh, run these two commands here. The first one uh, creates a virtual environment, and the second one uh, activates the virtual environment. Uh, I can maybe... Uh, make the text a little bit bigger so you can see. Um, okay, and then also, once you've created your virtual environment, there is a useful extension here. Um, to get IntelliSense working on CodeSpaces, uh, which is basically um, the feature in CodeSpaces or VS Code that allows you to, um, to have autocomplete in your code or navigate to the um, uh, source code of the packages that you're using. Um, to get that working, we're gonna need to install this uh, Python extension. So, um, so yeah, to do that, um, is my code space ready now? Um, yeah, it looks like it's almost ready. I have my code here, but it's still taking some time. Uh, okay, but I'll just show you how to um, get the extension, so from the extensions tab on the side, you can search for Python. I think, um, are people having trouble with uh, creating their code spaces? Is it, might be the internet here. Okay. We can also work locally. Uh, so if we are struggling, then we're just gonna switch to working locally. Um, open my Visual Studio Code. And here I have my service already checked out. So um, whether it's, uh, actually no, that's not the right one. I'm just gonna clone my current, oh, this is my fork, so I'm just going to clone it locally instead of code spaces. Um, Because I'm on my company's laptop here, I have to uh, connect to my BBVPN, but you don't have to do that. Okay, um, I'll let it do that, but um, okay, I mean, you have the instructions here, I can show you in a bit, but you have the instructions here for how to install um, a VS Code extension. It works the same way on, on code spaces um, than it does um, on uh, VS Code. Um, if you don't have VS Code, don't worry about it, like just, you know, use your preferred Python um, uh, ID, that's fine. Um, but um, it does become important now that we create the, um, the Python virtual environment if you are working locally. Um, 
Okay, so I am connected now to my BVPN, so I can clone. Okay. Was anyone able to get code spaces working, or are we? Yeah. Okay, just a couple of people. A few people. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, even cloning is taking a while. That is not a good sign. <laughs> we all try to stop. Okay, um, we'll, we'll let the internet go at its own pace, but um, <laughs> we'll continue. Um, okay, so we've done this. Wow, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna try to switch to my hotspots here because it looks like the Wi-Fi is just very, very slow. We'll, we'll wait for it to clone, but um, I will walk you through the files. Uh, oh, okay, uh, I am connected now, so I'm gonna try one more time to clone my repo. And okay, that is much faster. Switch. Okay. So let's take a look at, um, you can see here, and let me try to zoom in. Mm. Okay, I'm not sure how to zoom in. Oh, there we go. Okay, hopefully this is visible and you can see. Um, so yeah, so uh, let's take a look at the files that we have here. So this is our uh, fast API service. Um, inside the market SVC folder is where we're gonna be making all of our changes today. Um, there is a DB folder that has this um, SQL script. So to make, um, um, like here it defines like the tables that uh, we saw earlier in the presentation. So we have the items table, we have the address, we have the customer table, a customer has an address, and um, we have the orders table um, an order is made by a specific customer at a given time, and then we have the order items table that lists the items in a, a specific order. We've also inserted some sample data here to make it easier for you, um, for us to like uh, play around with the data so we don't have to uh, go inserting uh, data manually. And this is also just um, a convenience for this tutorial. Uh, we just like reset the state every time you execute this script so that we can all kind of have the same data and we can uh, kind of um, compare our results if we wanted to. Um, so yeah, there's this like quick Python file here that executes the script. So on service startup, this uh, initdb.sql file is gonna be executed to initialize your SQLite database. Um, then there is server.py. So this is the entry point to our app. Our app uh, is a fast API app. Um, and we are running it here on localhost and on port 9090. Uh, we've also enabled the hot reload option so that um, you don't have to like, when you make changes, it can just reload your service and you don't have to manually like kill your service and restart it to um, have the changes that you make to your code take effect. It just makes our development a little bit easier. And then uh, these are the endpoints. Um, um, that we've added to the service to exercise various um, um, SQL um, uh, examples. So, um, I mean, I, I mentioned some of these examples, so you, you uh, are probably expecting some of these endpoints, customers, orders, order total, orders between dates, and adding a new order. Um, for each of the endpoints here, there is a, um, you know, the corresponding handler function that just um, contacts the function responsible for managing the database and then uh, returns a response. 
So now let's look at the key file, which is um, database accessor. So database accessor is where we're gonna be making most of our changes. This is um, the layer that manages the database. And as you can see, initially here, we're just using um, SQLite 3 to connect to the database, execute a query, um, and yeah, and all of these functions are just executing raw SQL queries. Um, so if you have managed <laughs> to um, clone the, um, clone the uh, repo uh, or open it on whatever code spaces or locally, uh, have a look at each of the um, SQL queries so you can familiarize yourself with like what, what to expect here. Uh, are people able to uh, clone the service or open code spaces? A few. Okay, if anyone is still having trouble, you can also use my hotspot, it says, um, it's AS. Uh, the password is just SQL Alchemy. Oh. Um, okay, so um, a couple more files to look at here. There is the requirements.txt file, which lists the dependencies that we need. So far, um, you know, we just have uh, fast API related um, uh, dependencies and rough is just a formatter, but as we go along, we're gonna be adding dependencies here. And then finally, there is this uh, convenience shell script that we created uh, to make it easy for you to just um, run the service and hit each of the HTTP endpoints so that you don't have to uh, write these long um, kind of verbose uh, HTTP queries. We can just uh, easily exercise each of the endpoints through this shell script. So um, to use it, um, first I'm gonna be creating my virtual environment, because I haven't done that. Um, and I'll be installing my, my dependencies and um, running the service shortly. Okay, so I've just uh, created my virtual environment and now I'm gonna activate it. And then I'm gonna install my dependencies. This might take a little bit of time because the internet is not great. Okay, but we're now familiar with how, um, you know, how the service is structured. So now uh, let's talk about, um, if you are curious about some of the details about how the service is set up, Everything is written um, in the um, instructions website for the tutorial, so you can have a read through. Um, yes, okay. So we've is I'm installing the dependencies, and now um, once it's done, I'll show you how to run the service, but uh, it's still installing the dependencies, so I'm gonna move on to the next section. Um, okay, so um, now that we're familiar with the, yeah. Yes, well, you can have, um, you can look at the instructions if you follow the second um, link here. SQL Alchemy dash tutorial. And then you'd be able to just copy and paste the, the commands. Um, are people, okay, let me give people time. Are people at the stage where we're installing dependencies or not yet? Like, were we able to clone the service and then, um, sorry, install dependencies here. But now it works, okay. Maybe because some people kind of started working locally so the now code space is working for you, so. Um, okay, so some people are installing the dependencies now. Mm. Uh, mine are done installing. Okay, so now um, I can use my convenience script to just run the service. Um, so you can see here, um, okay, now my service is ready. It's saying that um, the application startup is complete. So in one terminal window, I'm, I'm running my service and in the other, I'm gonna be uh, hitting some of the uh, endpoints. Again, I'll use the convenience script here, for example, to get all the customers in the database. Um, so if I do a run and then customers, I should be able to get the list of customers. 
Uh, no, you're not. Um, you could if you want to. So you could install this Python extension. I, I can show how to do that. So there is the extensions tab here, whether you're on code spaces or you're working locally. Um, so if you search for Python, uh, mine is already uh, installed. But um, yeah, you want to uh, install this one, uh, the official one by Microsoft. Uh, mine is already installed, but you'll be um, running install. And um, once it's installed, uh, if you open up any Python file, you should be able to like point the Python extension to the um, to the Python interpreter that is inside your virtual environment. So this one here. So mine, I created it at a path called vnv. So mine is pointed to like vnv slash bin slash Python. So um, yeah, so once you've done that, you can test that IntelliSense is working by just, um, like for example here, I passed API is a dependency that I have installed when I ran um, uh, pip install requirements.txt. So if I command click or probably control click on Windows, um, it's able to actually take me to the source code of, um, of where this uh, is defined in the fast API package itself that I've just installed. So I can, you know, if I'm wondering how to use um, one of the one of the, you know, the APIs here that I've uh, imported, I can just command click on them, and uh, I can read some of the documentation. Um, or I would also have autocomplete if I want to, um, uh, if I'm typing. So that's how you know that IntelliSense is working. Okay, do people have IntelliSense working? So once you install the Python extension, were you able to do that? Okay, so um, did you set the path to, yeah? Okay, great, thanks. I'll come around to see if anyone has questions. Continue. Okay, so hopefully um, you've been able to run your service and uh, hit some of the API endpoints uh, to kind of give it a try. Um, so yeah, so now let's go back to looking at, sorry, SQL Alchemy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do we actually change the service from using um, like from using the SQL, SQLite library directly to using SQL Alchemy. The first thing we need to do is add SQL Alchemy as a pip dependency to our requirements.txt. And um, so you can just you know, copy that and uh, put it in your requirements.txt. And then because we've added a new dependency, um, we're gonna need to run a pip install again. So here, I'm gonna go and um, update my requirements.txt to add SQLite, um, sorry, to add SQL Alchemy. And I'm gonna be running um, pip install again to install SQL Alchemy. Okay, uh, so that's what it's telling you here. And then now to actually add SQL Alchemy to our code, um, we need to start by creating the engine object. So you may remember the engine object from um, the presentation, it's this object here that manages the connection pool and allows you to actually connect to the database. So this is our entry point um, to um, basically to, to connecting uh, with the database. Um, so yeah, so to create it, we from SQL Alchemy, we import the create engine API and we need to tell it what type of database we're trying to connect to. So we talked about the database type and the DB API type. So here our database type is SQLite and the DB API type is PySQLite. You will see later on when we talk about the asynchronous service that uh, we're gonna be using a different DB API but we're still using SQLite. And then finally here, this is the name of the database that we're connecting to. So we pass that to the, um, uh, to the URL uh, that the engine will connect through. And this last option here, echo true, it just um, gives us some useful log, log lines. It just basically shows the SQL statements um, 
that we will be executing when we exercise SQL Alchemy queries so that we can confirm our uh, understanding of what we're doing. And later on, when we uh, play around with optimization techniques, we want to be able to see exactly like what SQL statements were emitted um, when, we, um, when we execute a certain query. So this will be very useful. Okay, so uh, add this logic here to a file called uh, base.py. So you already have this folder here uh, under um, market as we see, DB. We want to create a new file and just copy the contents of this to, um, let me just minimize this, to our DB folder. So I will do that now. Okay. Now, uh, the next object that's important to know is the connection object. The connection object is basically, um, you remember the connection pool here, it's one of the connections from the connection pool that we obtain uh, from the engine object. Uh, a connection is basically like um, when you want to interact with a database, you establish a connection, you perform a series of, of operations, and then you want to close the connection. That's, you've probably done that with um, other uh, database libraries. So um, to, make, to make cleaning the connection a bit easier, because this is always the pattern, uh, we used a context manager API. Uh, so we use a with block to um, obtain our connection, and then that means that by the end of the with block, we don't have to remember to call connection.close because the context manager will do that for us. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, this is an example here of how you would uh, execute a query. So in our DB accessor.py, we want to start updating the execute query functions. So the first one is just execute query. Here I've imported the engine object that I've created earlier, this one. Um, and uh, I obtain a connection object from the engine object by, uh, by calling engine.connect. And like I said, I'm using it in a context manager so that by the end of this with block, SQL Alchemy calls uh, connection.close. So I'm sure that I've cleaned up the connection after I'm done using it. And then inside here, I'm using connection.execute to execute a query but we're still, using, um, we're still using a text query here. So this query parameter is still a text parameter. We're going to be uh, incrementally changing our code, but for now, we're not using, um, you know, we're going to stick with uh, SQL queries. We'll make incremental changes. And then, of course, these are the parameters. If the SQL alchemy, um, if the um, SQL statement is passing some parameters, then, you know, we want to pass the parameters dictionary to our uh, execute function. Okay, so what does the execute uh, connection, um, sorry, what does connection to execute actually return? Um, let's look at an example here. So we have this function, get customers, that uh, calls execute query and just selects all of the customers from my database. So that returns, um, we've, we've named the return value rows here, but um, the actual return object type from the connection.execute function in SQL Alchemy is this result type. So result, um, I, I, I see you have your hands up. I'll, I'll, I'll get to your question in a bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just listening. I'll give you some time uh, yeah, after I'm done with this section to uh, work. Um, yeah, so, um, I was saying that the return value from uh, connection.execute is um, a, a th this result object, which is basically an iterable of rows. Rows is another um, SQL Alchemy uh, construct. It behaves a lot like a name tuple, so you can just think of it as a name tuple. Um, yeah, so, so that's the return uh, type here, uh, which means that when I'm using it in my Flask app, I need to be, um, because this is like a name tuple and my fast API, sorry, I keep saying Flask because we used to be on Flask and we moved to uh, fast API. Um, but yeah, this is a fast API app and uh, I need to be returning um, 
uh, a dictionary because Fast API expects, um, you know, it's going to return a JSON object, right? So I want to turn my row objects, which are like name tuples, into dictionaries, and I can do that using this um, as dict uh, function. There are other solutions, but this is kind of the easiest one for now. Um, yeah, so at this point here, if you were to run your service, um, you know, you can run your service and in another terminal, we can exercise the customer's endpoints using the customer's um, uh, curl command. And because we've enabled the logs, you would be able to see in the terminal window where your service is running, SQL Alchemy has logged exactly what it did. So in this case, it just executed our select star uh, from customer query. It says how long it took to execute it. And at the end, there's a rollback statement, um, just uh, kind of signifying the end of the uh, select statement and keeping the connection, and the connection is closed, so you know it's clean for the next use. Okay. Um, I, I will give you some time here to, or actually let's cover like one more thing and then I'll, I will give you some time to work on your queries. Um, so because um, I was explaining how the return value here, this row type is, uh, behaves like a name tuple. So um, you can see an example in this function, get total cost of an order. So here I'm, I'm looking for um, a cost, right? So I'm looking for a specific number. And if you look at the SQL query involved here, um, so if I search, oops, if I search for uh, get total cost of an order, I have a select and I'm computing a sum um, and I'm naming my sum total. Um, so I'm computing the, the total cost basically of an order based on the individual order items prices. Right, and um, eventually I'm gonna end up with just one result that represents my sum, right? So here, like when we had uh, these uh, SQLite queries, we were accessing the, the result, like the total value, uh, like this, right? Because you know we didn't have name tuples, I needed to access the result, uh, the first result, because um, you know this is like a list of results. And then I need to access the first item in my results, which is total. But because SQL Alchemy makes things nicer, uh, I have this row object that is, um, behaves a lot like a name tuple. I can say, okay, out of my set of results, I want to get one result, and then I want to access the dot total property of my results. Okay, so I'll give you some time here to work on your queries. If you are stuck or you're unsure, like what, um, let's work on, sorry, well, we haven't covered the insert queries yet. We're just working on the get uh, endpoints. So if you look at server.py, um, most of them are get queries. Only the last one is a post, like an insert into the database query. We haven't covered the insertion yet. So you can work on the get ones. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you some time to do that. If you're stuck, you can always uh, take a look at this branch um, because it contains the solutions for um, this step. So you can always uh, take a look. Like I, like this is my um, my fork here. If I go to uh, branch two and I click on this commit, I'll be able to see exactly what changes needed to be made. So like base.py was created to create the engine and what changes were made to dbxsr.py um, in order to uh, get it working. So you can take a look at that. Yep, I'll give you some time now. All right, so uh, hopefully we all have this, um, have this running. So now let's look at how to um, insert queries. Do, uh, how to handle insert queries. So before we do that one note on parameter binding, you, you may have noticed that um, in some of the queries when we're, um, you know, when we need to like uh, query a specific row, uh, we need to pass parameters as um, a dictionary of keys and values. Um, so this is just a warning here that you should never like just directly pass the value of say here customer ID 
directly into your string uh, because this um, this leaves your code like vulnerable to SQL injection attacks. So you always want to bind parameters like this. Uh, so he would say select star from customers where ID is this variable, and then you provide a dictionary with the keys and values that you actually want to uh, evaluate in your SQL query. This is, of course, you know, not just a SQL alchemy thing, this is just like general good practice with databases. But one thing that is cool here about SQL alchemy is that um, the syntax for binding queries, if you're using SQL alchemy, it's gonna, be, it's gonna remain the same. So if you were to migrate to a different database, you don't have to also update all of your raw SQL queries because different databases actually come with different syntaxes for binding, um, for binding your parameters. But now that we're using SQL Alchemy, we don't have to make any of those changes if we were to migrate databases. Okay. And then now for insertion, um, we're gonna look at two different styles of committing data. There is commit as you go and there is begin once. So commit as you go um, works as follows. So here I've updated my execute insert query function um, to use SQL Alchemy. So again, I'm using a context manager to connect to the database so that it can do the cleanup for me when I'm done. I am executing a text query and passing the dictionary of parameters. But here I am also obtaining the resulting cursor uh, from, my, uh, from my execution. And um, I've designed my function so that um, I am anticipating um, you know, that I'm gonna need one response back. So here um, I've said cursor.fetch1 because out of the iterable, uh, the result iterable that I'm gonna get back, I just want, I'm just interested in the first result uh, and that's the result that I want to return. But before I return, I call connection.commit so I can commit, uh, commit the data that I have inserted when I executed my query, and then I return result, and then that exits out of the um, with block here and calls connection.close, and my transaction to the database is complete. Um, so, so let's take a look at how that's used. So here um, in my add new order for customer function, the first thing uh, we're doing here is inserting a new order for the customer that's placing the order. So, um, you can see my insert query is here. Um, I'm inserting uh, the customer ID and the order time, uh, which is now. Um, and then I'm specifically instructing it to return the ID of the new order that has been inserted. So, um, so here this is what is being fetched when I say cursor.fetch1, because here I said returning ID, then that's what the result is gonna be. And um, if you remember, we said that the result uh, behaves like a named tuple. So that means that uh, I can just directly access dot ID uh, and that will, give me, um, that will give me the ID of the new order. So because I called it, um, sorry, because I called it returning, um, sorry, because I didn't rename it here, I'm just directly referring to the ID column then my name tuple will also have a property named ID and I can just access it directly. Um, okay, so now if you were to run a new order to exercise this logic here in SQL Alchemy, um, you're gonna see these logs being uh, generated. So it's gonna um, begin and then it's gonna, so that begins my transaction. It's gonna make one insertion into the orders table. Um, and uh, you can see these are the parameters being bound here, the customer ID is one. Um, and finally, at the end, uh, you can see the commit statement, so that's, um, that gets emitted when I call connection.commit here. Uh, it also tells me that my insertion into the database has been successful. If you know some exception were to be thrown, then I would actually see a rollback here, and um, you know my insertion wouldn't be successful. So SQL Alchemy will undo the, the insertions that were part of this transaction um, if an exception happens. Um, now, in this function, add new order for customer, um, we don't just want to add an empty order to the orders table, we also want to tell it what items are part of this order. So this function passes two things, customer ID and items. 
So I've created um, here with my first insertion, I've created a new order for that customer, but now I also want to tell the database what items um, are part of my order, right? So to do that, um, I've decided, you can do this in multiple ways, but I've decided to um, update my execute insert queries function, plural, um, to, to handle these, type of, um, these types of like bulk insertions. So I instead of me inserting a single row, I am inserting a list of rows into the, my database with a single insert statement. So um, you can see like the logic looks uh, very much the same, uh, except here I am not, um, you know, I, I'm not reading anything back from the database. And this is because I've decided that I'm gonna use this function uh, for queries that don't have, you know, that aren't specifically returning something. If, if I were to um, use a query here with this function that is returning something, then SQL Alchemy will error out if I try to commit without actually reading the results that I, that I said I would read, right? So it, it's gonna say like, hey, you still have a, um, an operation in progress, you're trying to commit the data before you actually read um, the, the, the data that you asked for it to be returned back. Um, so yeah, so this is, um, this is what we're not gonna do. Um, yeah, so if you, you can take a look at the final result here, if, uh, if I were to update, um, well, you can see the diff, right? So you can see like in my add new order for customers, I have the two insertions. Um, the only thing really I needed to modify from SQLite to, um, to moving to SQL Alchemy is just the way I access my ID. And of course, like the, the execute insert query functions themselves as we saw in the instructions. Um, so yeah, so now you can, I'll give you a moment to like work on your insert query and um, yeah, play around with it. Or actually, <laughs> actually we can also talk about the other style of committing and then I'll give you some time. Um, so, so the style that we just saw is called commit as you go which means, um, you know, as you, you know, as the name implies, you know, as you're inserting data, you're committing, committing, committing. But there's also another style called begin once, which is you establish a connection, and then you're gonna execute a series of transactions um, or a series of queries, uh, and then commit just once at the end, right? And, and this is made easy, like if you, if you, if your application, um, if it makes sense for you to use like this style of committing. Um, SQL Alchemy makes it easy by exposing this uh, API here. So here, instead of obtaining my connection using engine.connect, I'm calling engine.begin. Um, and again, it's a convenient uh, context manager, which means at the end of my with block, it, uh, before it closes the connection, it's gonna first call connection.commit. So I don't have to actually call it explicitly and then it's gonna close my connection. Um, so yeah, so here, even though you can see, um, I mean, this is just a, um, uh, it's a dummy example, but um, if you were to um, use this style of commitment, of committing, um, you'll, you'll be able to see that there is a commit statement um, that SQL Alchemy logs at the end, even though I didn't have to explicitly call um, connection.commit because the, the exit of this, um, the dunder exit function of this context manager took care of the committing for me. So that kind of um, um, is more geared towards this like begin once uh, type of like um, style of committing data. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll give you some time here now to work on your insert query. Okay. Um, so hopefully we've all had a chance to, um, um, you know, get our insert query working. Um, okay, so now uh, this is the more exciting part of the tutorial because we're gonna be using the more powerful features of um, SQL Alchemy, uh, and that is ORMs and the SQL expression language that allows us to just completely get rid of this, like, these giant, like, um, you know, raw strings and replace them with something more uh, readable.
so ORMs are, um, ORM stands for Object Relational Mapping. It's just a fancy way of saying that, um, you know, we're gonna have classes that map to the tables that we have in our database and we're gonna be able to interact with our database through those classes. So through familiar, you know, we all know how to interact with classes and we can just access, um, um, you know, the properties of the class as you would a regular object, except it's actually mapping to the tables in your database. So to do that, um, we first uh, declare a base class that um, inherits from this declarative base um, uh, class that SQLAlchemy.orm provides to give uh, all of the uh, mapped classes that we're gonna create the ability to basically map to the actual tables in our database. Um, so yeah, so um, you're gonna uh, modify base.py to just add this base class uh, here. And then we're gonna be creating a file, a new file per table in our database. Um, so we can represent each table in our database with a class that we can kind of easily interact with. Okay, so how, what does this class look like? The first thing is that it's gonna inherit from base, the base class that we uh, just created um, to give it the ability to actually map to a specific column in the database. Um, we can, um, now the properties in the class are gonna be the, um, the columns that you have in your uh, database. So if we um, don't remember, we have our initdb.sql file here that tells us what the customer table lo looks like. So it has a database, which is an integer, a name, which is a string, and then an address ID, which is um, an integer that refers to an address ID in this table here. So how are we gonna do that uh, in a class, right? So here, you know, uh, I've created my three columns, here ID, name, and address. I've specified their type using this like mapped uh, typing uh, um, capability that uh, sqlalchemy.orm provides. So I can say that uh, this is an integer, this is a string, and this is an integer. Um, and then I can also say, I can provide additional information uh, for a given column. For example, in my ID column, I want, I want SQL Alchemy to know that this is my primary key, and that I also want to auto-increment the ID so that when I insert new um, items into my table, I don't have to tell it like, hey, please use you know, the next ID, which you know, I may have to like look up to find out like what, um, what is the next ID number I want to use. So here, we're just using the auto increment property so that we don't have to compute the, the ID. And um, yeah, so, so that's how you know, we're, we're representing our customer table. Uh, we also have this, just to make uh, debugging easier really, like if you were to print an instance of a customer object, then uh, you know you can specify exactly how you want it to be printed, and here we've chosen to represent it like this. Yeah, um, you know, at this point here we haven't defined the relationship between customer and the other tables. Um, okay. Um, okay, maybe I'll uh, yeah I'll cover like how to. Um, represent relationships. So, um, you know, again, same idea, we've created the address table to represent, uh, the address class to represent the address table, and we've created the different uh, columns in our table, and we've specified our, their types, we've named which one is our primary key. But now, in order to represent the relationship between customer and address, we're using this relationship um, construct. So if you remember from here, or you can you look at the init uh, db.sql file as well, um, customer and address have like a one-to-one -one relationship. So uh, how do we actually represent that? So here I've created a customer property and I'm saying that it's of type customer. So it's not primitive type anymore like these ones, it's like um, my object type. And I'm um, explaining that this is a relationship to the customer, um, um, to the customer uh, table using this relationship construct. I, I'm saying that uh, I wanted to backpopulate this table here, like this table. Um, and I'm using 
this uh, relationship loading technique called joint. Um, we're gonna talk in more detail uh, in the optimization section on uh, what is this uh, relationship loading technique. But for now, we just need to know that um, when you load a customer uh, object, the address object is also gonna be loaded and, when, and vice versa as well because you know, um, you know, we've gone and uh, defined the opposite relationship in the customer table as well. So here we're creating an address, we're saying it's of type address, and we're saying this has a relationship to the customer uh, uh, table, right? Um, yeah, so um, I can give you time to uh, create, basically we need to create the classes for all of our tables now. Um, but maybe because you can see how this can get a little bit tedious, you can just, um, maybe you can do one manually on your own and then you can just check out the branch, um, the branch for step three, which, um, which yeah, will have all of the, under database, it will have all of the different, um, I'm not on step three, okay. So step three ORMs, you can see all of the um, different tables here. You can also copy and paste them. Uh, so yeah, um, if you if you don't want to write it out all uh, manually. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention here is we also created this like as dict function uh, just to be more selective about exactly which properties we want to display when we uh, when we return the response. So fast API. Um, you know, as we saw, like it expects, um, it, it needs to be able to return a JSON. So it needs to be able to express um, the result of the query um, as a JSON. And instead of just um, letting it just put all of the details or expose all of the details in a given object, we just provide this as dict um, functionality um, or function so that we can uh, be selective about exactly which properties we want to display. So we've done a similar thing for um, each of the classes. Uh, okay, <laughs> not this one, because this one's pretty basic, but some of the other classes. Uh, we have like an ASDICT um, um, function as well to like tell us exactly what we want to display. Okay, uh, I'll give you some time here. Um, I will also say that uh, the instructions for the tutorial as well have all of the uh, details written out. So if you are curious about you know, some of the finer details, you can always read the instructions in full uh, on your own time. And we have some links to some of the documentation as well if you're curious about um, um, you know, the, more, uh, the finer details. There are also these like test your understanding sections that you can you can kind of like challenge yourself to an to answer. Um, they're there throughout the uh, tutorial. Yes, also one thing that is um, useful to know is that there is this extension AutoMath that just auto-generates these classes for you if you don't want to actually maintain the code that uh, creates these ORM classes and you're happy with just the default implementation that the AutoMath extension uh, provides. It is an extension by SQL Alchemy itself, so um, you, know, uh, you can feel free to use it. Um, you can also use a mix of like auto-generated classes and um, you know, uh, code-defined classes like these if only one or two of your classes, let's say, um, you want to configure them in a specific way that isn't the default, uh, then you know you can do that as well. So it's a it's a useful extension. All right, uh, it's uh, three thirty, so let's continue. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to create all of your um, cus uh, all of your uh, ORM classes. Uh, so now let's see like how to actually use them. Um, so we're not only gonna make use of the classes we just created, but we also are going to make use of the SQL expression language. So that's uh, what allows us to now completely get rid of the raw SQL strings and you know, we, we will have no use for them anymore. 
So let's see how we can do that. So in our dbaccessor.py file, uh, I have imported, um, I mean, we already had the engine, but I've imported my customer uh, class. And uh, from SQL Alchemy, I'm now using this select um, uh, construct instead of the text one that we were using earlier. And I'm also uh, from sqlalchemy.rm um, using session. So session is basically this um, object that will allow me to not just establish a connection with the database and um, execute uh, potentially multiple um, uh, queries, but it also allows me to save the state of some of the um, the objects basically that um, you know I could be loading or creating or modifying. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. I think it will become clear with uh, examples uh, what that means. So here I'm modifying get customer. So I've established a connection with the database by creating a session. Again, I'm using a context manager so that it can take care of cleanup on uh, exit. And here you can see my query. Instead of writing the string select star from customer, I can now just directly use the select uh, construct and then refer to the customer class that um, we created. So now I have no need for the text anymore. I can, I've created the statement. I can now just call session.execute to create my statement. And that gives me a cursor that I can use to retrieve my results. So this result object here, um, I can uh, retrieve the results from. So uh, I call dot scalars because I don't want the row object anymore, like the name tuples that we've been dealing with so far. I want uh, actual like customer objects. And that's why I'm calling dot scalar. Um, and I also, I don't want to fetch, you know, just one. I want to fetch all of the customers. So now, um, after this line is executed, um, this object here is a list of customer objects um, that have all of the properties that uh, we've defined here uh, when we define the customer table. And because we've defined the relationship to address, it will also have the address uh, loaded because we've decided to use the, the, the joined loading technique. So if I uh, execute this code, um, okay, uh, just one final thing before we execute the code is that in server.py now, instead of using the dot uh, dunder as diffed, we're now using the one that we've defined on the customer class, uh, on the customer ORM class, which is like the dot as diffed. Um, okay, so now if I exercise this endpoint, I will see that um, SQL Alchemy has generated this query. So if you remember from before, uh, what did our query look like? It was just, um, it was just select star from customer. And this is what SQL Alchemy also logged, right? It was just a select star from customer. But now that we're using um, ORMs, our query now looks different. And why is that? Because um, it's not only because of the relationship we've defined uh, between customer and address. It's not just getting the customer, but it's also getting the address of the customer. So you can see it's doing a left outer join here on the address table and also getting the address um, um, properties. So in one query now, I've loaded the customers and their addresses. Of course, this may or may not be the behavior that you want, depending on you know what your service is actually trying to do. Um, and this uh, behavior is configurable, and we're going to talk about that in optimization techniques, so we can understand the different loading techniques and understand um, under what conditions you may want to use uh, different loading techniques. Okay, uh, and if I were to also like print customers, you can see here it's a list of customer objects. And um, yeah, it, it just it has the customer and it has the address and it looks like this. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll give you a bit of time here as well to um, to not too much time because we kind of need to um, uh, you know start uh, going. Um, but yeah, basically we can just. Um, like if you were to update each of the functions, your code now will look like this. So your queries are going to look 
um, a lot more kind of like um, uh, object oriented, right? We're now using the the, the constructs that um, the SQL expression language that um, SQL Alchemy provides to replace our uh, raw strings. So now our DB accessor has no raw strings whatsoever. Um, so I'll give you a few minutes to work on the select queries and then I'm gonna cover the insert query. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, we're gonna move on, but you can always uh, check out the branch ORM, step three ORMs, uh, and you will have the code uh, so you can follow along from there. Um, Okay, so let's talk about how to insert data using the SQL expression language, and now that we have our ORM classes defined. Um, I can just create an object, like an, say like an address object, like that, right? And um, if I want to um, insert it, I can create my session, add the objects to it, and that would just be the equivalent of doing an insert statement. So let's see how to do that in our insert function. So we have this function here, add new order for customers. And here, um, again, like you're, you're familiar now with this function, so I want to add a new order for my customer, but I also want to add uh, which items exist um, in my order, in the customer's order. So I'm gonna start by establishing a connection to the database, and first I want to add my new order, right? So now uh, I say, um, uh, I first want to get my customer who wants to add the order. So here I just selected a customer where the customer ID is just customer ID. And you can see uh, this is the customer ID variable that was passed from the um, fast API uh, query, right? Um, so you can see here now the parameter binding takes on like a, a more kind of like um, Pythonic feel like we don't have to pass a, a dictionary of key values anymore. We can just say, I want my customer ID to be to match this value, right? So now that I have my customer object, I can now create uh, an order for that customer this way. So I create an order object the way I, you would create any other uh, Python instance of a, of a class. Um, and I populate it uh, by the customer ID. Um, the order time is just now, and the customer is, I want to um, link it to my customer, so I've, um, I've just passed the customer object. Um, and then, so at this point here, I've created my order, and I get the new order ID back. Uh, actually, the new order object back. Um, well, not back, but you know, this is my new order object. So now, um, I can make my insertion by uh, for the order items by creating like this list of order items here. Uh, so yeah, we just are using like list comprehension to go through all of the items in the uh, dictionary of items that was passed here. So I'm just initializing a number of order item objects and I'm just setting them as a property of my new order object. So now I have an order, the order is linked to a customer and it also has a set of order item objects. So once I've linked all of these together, I can just go ahead and add them to the session. Now adding them to, this, to the session doesn't actually contact the database, it just tells, uh, it kind of like stages them uh, to be ready to be committed. And then once I actually uh, call session.commit, this is when um, it actually makes it to the database. Um, assuming of course there were no exceptions. So uh, yeah, this is an explanation of that. Um, so now if I exercise this new order endpoint, I should be able to see these logs here generated from my service. So let's take a look at them. So the first one, as we expect, is our customer, um, is our customer ID, uh, is our customer query, right? So that's the one matching um, us getting the customer here, right? And then the next one is, um, inserting into orders. Uh, so that's the order object that we created and then insert into order items, the list of items that we, uh, that the customer wants to buy. So uh, one select and two insert statements as we uh, expect. Um, yeah. Okay. 
thing. Okay, I'll give you two, three minutes <laughs> to uh, do that and then we'll move on. I'm going to ask, like, does anyone have the, their insert already done, or do we need time to uh, do? Yeah, already done. Great. Okay, you need time. Okay. No. Okay, so let's let's um, give it a few minutes and. Um, no. So if you're unsure about anything, you can always look at the, the completed version of the code. Um, so here I am on the branch step three ORMs. And you can see um, that we'd created uh, a file per, uh, per table. But of course, this is a choice that we made. We, you could have also just put them all in the same file if you want. But you know, typically, you put a given class in a separate file because you may want to extend it with additional uh, functions, and we'll be doing that when we look at some of the optimization techniques. Um, yeah. All right. Um, hopefully, you've had a chance to update your insert uh, statement and play around with it. If not, you can check out the branch uh, step three ORMs and just carry on from there. Um, okay, so the last thing we're gonna look at before we look at the async version of the service are some optimization techniques. So now we understand how to, um, how to connect uh, to a database using SQL Alchemy. We understand SQL expression language and we understand ORMs and we know how to use them to make our code like a lot more um, a lot more pythonic. And I want to have the code visible here as well. Um, yep. So now let's look at uh, some optimization techniques. So as we saw in the previous section, maybe that eager loading um, where it just, you know, it, it's just uh, in my query, when I'm querying customers, it's also uh, loading all of the addresses. That might not always be the most optimal thing. So um, in our code so far, we've been using eager loading. Uh, but you can also uh, set different um, loading techniques. So in general, uh, there is um, a broad term called lazy loading, which is only load um, a property if I access it. So if I have a parent class, like say customer, and a child class, like address, I only want to emit another select statement if I access customer.address. But otherwise, do not, you know, do not load it. So uh, it might sound that this is always like the more optimal answer, but um, it, it's not always the case, right? Um, depending on like what your like real service is doing, what type of like um, queries you're actually making, it may or may not be optimal. For example, um, oh, so here this is just saying that if you wanted to do lazy loading, um, one of the lazy loading techniques that uh, SQL Alchemy uh, provides is uh, this select option. So it's basically it's what I described. Um, like it will only load uh, the related property if you um, access it. Um, yeah, so when might this lazy loading not be the most efficient? So say in my get customers object here, uh, sorry, function here, after I, um, after I uh, query all of my customers, I am doing some operation on customer.address. If I had set the customer dot address to uh, to be lazily loaded, that means that every time I access customer dot address, I am emitting a whole separate select statement, which is now you know now that exploded the number of select statements that I'm making. Like instead of um, you know instead of just 
uh, being able to load my customers and addresses in the same uh, select statement with uh, an outer join, I have now um, expanded them to like what we call the, um, the n plus one problem, right? So, um, yep, the n plus one problem because now I'm not only loading, making one select statement to load the parent uh, objects, I'm also now making like n additional select statements every time I access the property of the related parent. So this is an example, of, this is like an access pattern where actually eager loading would have been more efficient because I would have just done one select statement with a left outer join and I don't need to like connect to the database multiple times to make multiple select statements. So yeah, again, depending on what you're doing, it might make sense to set your relationship loading technique to lazy or, um, or eager. Um, yeah, I've explained eager loading. Uh, there is also what is known as like no loading. Maybe you really want to make sure that you don't accidentally, um, uh, you know, load um, basically unwanted lazy loads. So instead, you set the lazy parameter on your relationship to raise an exception, basically to like alert you that like, hey. You know, you're invoking a, la um, a lazy load here when you know you didn't mean to because you explicitly set this relationship to uh, throw an exception if you if you access if you um, invoke an unwanted lazy load. Again, depending on the scenario, this might be um, this might be uh, a behavior that you want. Um, okay, another useful thing here that ships with SQL Alchemy is this like function like this func um, capability. So before we used to just um, compute the sum ourselves uh, in Python. So if I show you, um, where is the sum? Yeah, so when we've made the change here, we computed the sum ourselves by just summing up all of the, um, the items here. Uh, or we've done it when we used to have the raw SQL queries, we've done like the raw like sum function. But um, in order to avoid SQL Alchemy um, allows you to just like access like um, uh, these like standard SQL functions that you would have been able to access in your raw queries. Uh, it allows you to also be able to access them when you switch to this style of querying so that you don't have to do things outside of the query itself in Python like this, like the, the common operations like some. So, um, so yeah, so here it exposes, um, like I can access the sum function using like func.sum. So now I can compute the sum in my query as opposed to like having to do it outside in my Python query and now I only have one result that represents the sum as opposed to uh, having to get all of the order items and then sum them up here. Um, okay, so that's another um, useful thing to know about and this is the resulting um, the query. You can see uh, it looks similar to the raw SQL query that we had before but um, you know, now we don't have to use raw uh, strings anymore. Okay, and then the final thing that is like useful to know about are hybrid attributes. So oh. there, are, um, there are hybrid properties and hybrid expressions. Um, so hybrid properties are where, assuming you have an operation that is very common that um, you want to be using over and over, but you don't want to keep repeating it in your various different um, uh, queries. So I could do something like this where I define a hybrid property using the uh, hybrid property decorator. So say for example, this item total uh, computation is something that I want, I know that I'm gonna be using over and over and I don't want to just um, repeat it in my SQL queries. So I can defi define this like hybrid property um, and you know call it item total and put my logic here um, so that then in my query, I would just be able to call like um, uh, order item dot item total and it will invoke this property which will actually compute my uh, item total without me having to put that in my 
logic every time. Um, and then there's also a related uh, concept called hybrid expressions. So um, while like the hybrid property was on the object level, on the class level, you can also use the hybrid property to define a uh, hybrid expression. So that will also that will allow me to um, do a similar thing, but during uh, my query itself. So here, for example, um, when I'm computing my sum, I can do func dot sum and then order items dot item total directly inside my query, and that would execute this logic here, like item dot price times my current class, which is um, order items dot quantity. Uh, so that's just, yeah, if, if you have like common operations that you, you don't want to have to spell out over and over, like um, what we had to do here, um, like what we had to do, sorry, above. Um, before we introduced the hybrid expression. Now we've moved this piece of logic inside the class itself so that we can just uh, more easily access it. Uh, yeah, so um, these are basically uh, some of the things that can make your, um, make your uh, code a little bit more succinct when you're working with the SQL expression syntax. Um, yeah. Um, in the interest of time, <laughs> um, we're just gonna, um, you know, directly check out the branch step for optimizations because I need to start on the asynchronous part. Okay, so hopefully you all feel like, um, um, you know, you have a good grasp on like how to work with um, SQL Alchemy up to this point. And now we want to look at uh, how to do the same thing, but for an asynchronous service that uses asyncio. But before, we do that um, in case uh, some of you aren't uh, too familiar with AsyncIO. Um, I'm gonna go through a series of quick exercises that will kind of slowly build your basic knowledge of AsyncIO. Um, the explanation for the exercises um, is here, uh, but I will also go through it interactively here. So first, um, before we look at the exercises, um, SQL Alchemy, um, sorry, AsyncIO is basically how, um, okay, there is a concept of cooperative multitasking in many languages, and in Python, uh, cooperative multitasking is made um, easy or easier, more accessible through the popular library AsyncIO. Right, so um, if you um, are not too familiar with cooperative multitasking, let me try to zoom in here so you can see this diagram. So uh, cooperative multitasking is different from preemptive multitasking, which is typically like um, uh, when, when you have multi-threading, for example, and you have multiple cores, uh, not in Python, in, you know, in general, um, you know, then the different tasks that are scheduled on your different cores would look something like this over time, right? So you can have, um, um, you know, core one running, um, you know, um, two or three of your tasks. And um, in preemptive multitasking, there is an external entity like a scheduler, uh, whether it's like an OS level scheduler or a scheduler in your, um, in your language itself, like Go has like a, its own scheduler. Um, it, it, it is the one that decides like when to switch between tasks. Um, so you can distribute the tasks between your cores and then you have a scheduler that's deciding when to switch between them. This is preemptive multitasking. But in cooperative multitasking, uh, you are the one, you as the programmer, you are the one who is in control of when to yield um, control uh, from your coroutine to another coroutine uh, so that someone else can have the chance to uh, execute on the CPU. Uh, this is very useful when your application has uh, a lot of I.O. bound operations, and this is where the name um, async I.O. comes in. It's because um, you have I.O. bound tasks, and instead of 
my function or my coroutine hogging the CPU, basically waiting for the IO operation to complete. Instead, we, uh, it yields control to allow someone else, some other coroutine to use the, um, uh, the CPU while it's waiting for the IO operation to complete. And once it's complete, it gets the control back and it can resume execution. So th this is like the general idea of um, async IO. Now, uh, how it does that is basically using the async def uh, syntax. Um, so this is how I would define a coroutine to tell Python that this is um, an asynchronous um, coroutine rather than a regular function, I would use the async function. And in order to actually voluntarily yield control to some other coroutine to execute, I would either use the await keyword, so that's me awaiting on some other coroutine or some IO operation to complete, and I'm saying I want to pause my execution here while this other task completes its execution, and then I will be resuming from that point on. I could also use the keyword yield. This is um, typically used when I'm trying to um, say yield results from an asynchronous generator. We're gonna look into that later. Um, okay, so let's look at some examples because it will make what I'm saying clearer. Um, okay, so now um, I, I hope that, uh, that the text is like large enough. I'll try to, I don't know. Okay, if, if the text is not large enough, then you can always um, just check out the branch yourself. So in uh, your code, you're gonna have the same files uh, on branch number five, so asyncio intro, so you can look at the files yourself uh, and also run them along with me as I talk about them so that um, you understand, um, you understand uh, what to expect, yeah? Okay, so the first one is just a very basic um, example, it's like a, completely synchronous code, we have a main function that has a number of jobs, um, and it dispatches each of the jobs to a worker. The worker just prints the start and end time, and it just sleeps in the middle to simulate some kind of like IO operation. Um, of course, because this is a completely you know, um, synchronous code, uh, what is gonna happen here is exactly what you expect. Um, so I'm just gonna run it here. I don't know if you can um, see the terminal, but um, as you can see, like things executed, of course, very sequentially because um, there is no uh, asynchronicity, asynchronicity here whatsoever. But we're gonna be taking this example and we're gonna be making it asynchronous. So in um, the next, um, uh, file here, like async tasks, I have modified my code so that it uses, uh, the worker now is a coroutine because I've used the async def um, uh, keyword. And instead of just uh, sleeping here, I am using the async io.sleep function, so the asynchronous variant. It allows me to await the sleep instead of just uh, sitting idle. So. Uh, while this coroutine is executing, while it's waiting, um, while it's like sleeping, uh, it can yield control, so give someone else the chance to execute while it's just waiting for the IO operation to complete. And then now in my main function, um, I have dispatched uh, two jobs, the order milk and order bread, to two different workers, uh, but I've awaited each one of them. Now, you know, what, what, what behavior do we expect to happen? So if I run this here, you can see order milk started, order milk done, order bread started, order bread done. So actually, um, even though I've turned my worker into a coroutine, I didn't gain anything at all by making it a coroutine because I I'm awaiting each worker individually. So yes, I've made it asynchronous, but I didn't actually, because of the way I awaited my workers, um, you know, I fully, um, basically the, um, the main coroutine is, uh, starts running, right? And um, 
um, then uh, at this line here, we say await this worker. So it creates this coroutine, puts it on the event loop, and, um, and it starts running, right? But because main is awaiting here, it cannot resume execution. So it never scheduled this other worker, which means this coroutine has to fully execute first before uh, the main coroutine can proceed to the next line here where I'm dispatching my next worker. So actually this pattern here didn't help me at all. Instead, if I didn't do this, and I, so I'm commenting out lines 14 and 15 if you're following on your laptop, and I'm uncommenting line 20. So here, instead of awaiting each worker uh, separately, I've used the functionality asyncio.gather. Uh, and I've dispatched then the two workers um, inside my async io.gather call. So what that does is um, first schedule both coroutines on the event loop before it starts awaiting them. Um, so uh, going back to the instructions here, we can try to visualize the, um, the order of events here like this. Um, So this is the synchronous version. And then, um, okay, sorry, I only have the, <laughs> the, the animation for the synchronous version here. But yeah, basically here, when I switch to using gather, um, I've scheduled both, if we visualize the event loop as like a queue, basically we can think of it as like a priority queue where, um, you know, of course this is an approximation, um, but we can think of it as a priority queue. So when I schedule things on the event loop, then next available coroutine uh, is the one that gets to execute. So here, um, before when I awaited one coroutine uh, before running the next one, um, I only had main and worker on my event loop. Uh, and so I had to fully wait for worker to be done before actually scheduling the next worker. Um, but when I call asyncio.gather, it puts both coroutines on the event loop before it starts running them. So that allows me to actually benefit from the asynchronous uh, nature here. So you can see here, um, now uh, milk started and then bread started and then milk is done and then bread is done. Um, so, um, um, Okay, the next one here uh, kind of shows you in more detail how asyncio.gather uh, works. Uh, so we can um, manually ourselves uh, schedule tasks on the event loop before awaiting them. So this would be equivalent to what asyncio.gather did. So here, instead of directly awaiting worker, I've just added it as a task, which adds it on the event loop, and then, um, and then I've added the other task, my worker two, the order spread, and then um, I await task one, and then I await task two. So hopefully you can see that because both, wor uh, both workers were added on the event loop before I started awaiting any of the tasks, that these tasks are actually gonna execute um, asynchronously. So, um, so this, this behavior, this achieves similar behavior to uh, asyncio.gather here. So if I were to run this, then, um, Yep, you can see that um, it's like order milk, bread, milk, bread. Um, so yeah, that, that achieves similar behavior to asyncio.gather. So this, this uh, create task API gives you the flexibility to be able to schedule tasks, um, you know, like to schedule all the tasks up front that you need them to be um, uh, executed um, concurrently before you start awaiting or like yielding control to someone else. Um, and then there is um, some syn um, new syntax here in uh, Python 3.11. So instead of me calling asyncio.gather, the more preferred approach is the task group. So here, I again, I, I use the um, create task API, but instead of just calling asyncio.createTask, I am uh, scheduling the tasks on my task group. 
So I used this um, asynchronous context manager uh, to create a task group, and then I scheduled my tasks on them. And this is um, very similar behavior to asyncio.gather, uh, or very similar behavior to what we've done here, where we've scheduled our tasks first before awaiting them, except here that wait is implicit. It happens uh, basically at the end of this uh, context manager. So this is, again, the exact same behavior as uh, the, the, the previous example that we saw. But the advantage of using uh, task groups here is that if one of the uh, workers throws an exception as it's executing, um, then the task group would just like cancel all the other remaining uh, coroutines uh, that are part of that task group so that you don't get unexpected behavior. Um, and then uh, we'll just go over one more example, which is um, explaining what asynchronous generators are. Um, so here I have, um, I have a task group, and I want to dispatch a number of orders. So dispatch orders is a function that um, just, you know, again, simulates, um, you know, some kind of like busy, busy I.O. operation, and it, uh, it yields uh, a range of values. So this is what we call, because this is a coroutine, this is what we call an asynchronous generator. If you're familiar with generators already, um, you know, you can kind of recognize this pattern, except that this is the asynchronous version of it. So what is the advantage of using an asynchronous generator here? Is that I can use it in an asynchronous for loop. Um, so an asynchronous for loop is able to like yield control back to the event loop while it's awaiting for the next uh, piece of work to be done. So, um, so if I run this here, um, so you can see there is like a busy wait here in between dispatching orders. And, but because it's an asynchronous generator, I can take advantage of this to do some other work while I'm awaiting the next uh, the next piece of um, uh, the next results basically to be produced by the asynchronous generator. So here I commented out the 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 function deliver order and the coroutine deliver order, and you can see that now I'm able to take advantage of the asynchronous for loop by um, dispatching and then delivering an order intermittently as I'm waiting for the next order to be dispatched. Um, okay, so it's, it's a lot of um, kind of um, uh, theory <laughs> to go through, but hopefully you now kind of like get the basics of um, AsyncIO. Of course, the details are written here if you want to kind of read through them, read through them slowly um, on your own time, and we have some um, animated GIFs here to take you through um, the order of events. Okay. So um, now that we understand like why asyncio is useful, we're gonna look at how to use SQL Alchemy in an asynchronous service. So, like I said, um, asyncio is useful to basically uh, be able to like maximize the use of your CPU um, when you have an application that is I/O heavy. You don't want to be just like hogging the CPU waiting for the I.O. operation to complete. And of course, the database access is an example of an I.O. operation. So every time we connect to a database, we commit to the database, that's an I.O. operation that, you know, we're just, you know, our, our execution thread is just like waiting for the I.O. operation to complete. So if instead we're using an asynchronous version and we're using the asynchronous version of the SQL Alchemy uh, framework, then we don't have to be hogging the CPU just waiting for these I.O. operations to complete. We can, um, you know, parallel, well, I don't want to use the term parallelize here because it's not fully accurate, but asynchronize um, our code. Okay, so um, to, to add SQL Alchemy to our asynchronous service, we can um, check out this branch. I, I don't need to. Okay.
Okay, so again, it's still um, the same service that we are familiar with and we've been working on. Um, it's the Fast API uh, wrapper, um, sorry, the Fast API application that is running our marketplace app. And uh, yeah, the only difference is that now our requests are asynchronous. Um, here, the logic um, doesn't use SQL Alchemy, and we're going to be changing it incrementally to add SQL Alchemy. Um, I'll point out just a few differences. For example, the function handlers of the different endpoints are now coroutines, like they're using the async def uh, keyword. Um, we're also making use of like the async for uh, syntax where we can um, use an asynchronous generator. We're also awaiting um, the, the, our function execution instead of just um, synchronously waiting for it to uh, execute. Um, so this is server.py, and then in database.py, you can see we're using this library here. This is like the async version of a SQLite 3, the one that we saw on main, um, but now we're using the async version of it. So um, yeah, you can see here that we are awaiting all of the interactions with the database. So in this async with statement, we are connecting to a database that's an IO operation that we don't want to, um, uh, that we don't want to just like sit idle and wait for it. So we use an async with statement instead of uh, just a regular with statement. Um, again, a database execute, um, you know, we can await that. Uh, we can await cursor.fetchall. We can await database.commit. That's um, another connection to the database that we don't want to um, you know, again, hog the CPU while we're waiting for it to happen. Uh, so yeah, so you get the idea now. Like we, we instead of just, um, you know, uh, synchronously executing the all, all of the IO operations, we are giving a chance for someone else to use the event loop while we're just awaiting the IO operations. So now um, we're gonna take this logic and we're gonna add SQL Alchemy to it. Um, it's pretty intuitive from uh, you know from from here on out, like because uh, you've seen how to use SQL Alchemy, and the asynchronous version of it is very very similar. Um, there is some detail here if you're interested on like how um, uh, statements like async with. Uh, are actually able to like yield, yield control to the event loop and how um, their implementation is similar and how it's different from the regular uh, the regular like context manager that you're used to like the synchronous version. Um, so you can read through that. Um, another difference here is that um, we've introduced um, a function that basically allows us to stream queries. So here we're making use of the async for statement, the, um, the asynchronous generator that we talked about, um, to ba basically be able to like generate one result at a time instead of loading all of the results in memory all at once. Um, we, you know, when we anticipate that we're gonna be reading a lot of data from the database. Um, We've also uh, added one more endpoint, orders total, which exercises the concept of task groups. Um, so yeah, you, I'll give you some time to like um, explore the code a little bit, but um, so you can see like how all the different uh, features of you know async IO that we just talked about are being used in this service. Um, okay, uh, I think I'll give you a few minutes here, and then I'll talk about how to add uh, SQL Alchemy now to. Uh, the asynchronous service. All right, so to add SQL Alchemy to the asynchronous, to our asynchronous service, um, uh, you know, uh, we need to add SQL Alchemy back to requirements.txt because it's not there on the vanilla version of um, the asynchronous service. So, um, yeah, so we'll add that. And then basically, you're gonna be familiar with these steps now. 
uh, because we've done a lot of them, we're just doing now the asynchronous version of them. So here, instead of creating our regular engine object, we're creating the asynchronous engine object. So you can see um, the URL here is also a bit different. Uh, so we're still using SQLite, but we're using this DB, um, this like dialect, which is the AIO SQLite, so the asynchronous version of the uh, of the dialect, right? Uh, everything else uh, still the same. We still want our debug logs. Um, yeah, and then when we're executing a query, we're going to be using, uh, we're going to be making use of like asynchronous. Um, keywords in order to make sure that we are not, uh, again, hogging the CPU when we're actually contacting the database. So here I'm using async with engine.begin. So you remember engine.begin is something we looked at when we talked about uh, the begin once uh, uh, committing style. Um, so, um, but here instead of, again, waiting synchronously for the connection to be established, I'm just using async with. And then I'm also awaiting uh, the connection.execute line. Um, again, to give someone else the chance to execute while I uh, run connection.execute. Um, here, like, you know, we're back to using the text query so we can see how to separate the core from the ORMs again in the uh, asynchronous version. Um, this is some detail about how like the context manager works here. Uh, it's gonna be calling the dunder a exit function is going to be calling uh, connection.commit uh, and connection.close uh, when um, when you're out of this asynchronous with block. Um, so yeah, uh, and the insert again works in a very similar way to what we've seen before, except we also need to call connection. Um, well, you know because we're using engine.begin here, this actually is uh, redundant. Um, but if you were using the other style of commitment, of committing, like the commit as you go, as opposed to begin once, then you would need to be awaiting the connection dot commit so that, um, again, you give someone else a chance to execute while you're uh, contacting the database. Um, stream query here, we're again using the connection dot stream, which is an API that um, SQL Alchemy exposes, again, to give us that, um, uh, asynchronous generator um, uh, type of result instead of just returning the results all directly into one single list. Um, and again, we can uh, you know access the results like this uh, because the name tuple that results or you know the row object which behaves a lot like a name tuple, um, you know um, we can just access properties on it like using the, um, the the name of the property in our query. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, like you've seen a lot of this before. Um, so hopefully uh, this time around is going to be a lot simpler, but you're going to be just thinking about where you need to be giving some, uh, like some other coroutine on the event loop a chance to execute while you're executing your logic. So where you're going to be awaiting um, the IO operations. So I'll give you some time here, and yeah. Uh, of course, the results of this step are going to be in this branch here: step six, asyncio, SQL Alchemy solved. Uh, so you can also just take a look at the diff uh, to understand what you would have needed to add. Um, so I can just where's my code? Where's my code? So if I here and I look at step six solves I can um, look at this commit and I will be able to see the exact changes that I need to make in order to take an asynchronous service from using you know like the the direct um, AIO SQLite uh, library to the SQL Alchemy version. So you can go through the diff here and understand what you need to do. Um, okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to add SQL Alchemy to um, our asynchronous service now. 
Um, so the last thing we're going to be doing is looking at cyclopomy with ORMs in an asynchronous service. So if you check out this branch as your base, um, it's basically, um, it adds back the ORM classes that we've added in, the, um, in step three so that you don't have to um, create all of the classes again manually yourself. Um, but now we're going to be um, looking at what are the key um, changes that we need to make to make ORMs work in an asynchronous service. So um, the first thing we're going to do is uh, instead of using a regular session, of course, we're going to be using the asynchronous version of it, so an asynchronous session. Um, because we need a new session per, uh, per uh, say, like transaction to a database, we're going to be using this async uh, session maker, which is basically an async uh, session factory. Um, we've chosen like this option here, which is expire on commit um, false, because uh, we want, you know, it's a choice that we made. Um, if we had to turn it to true, then as soon as you commit, the, the data would expire and you wouldn't be able to um, use it. So um, another um, change we make here is using the async adders mixin in our base class. So what that does is um, make sure that you're not accessing any um, lazily loaded attributes directly without awaiting them. So because you know we're in asynchronous now, when you if we had um, our relationship loading set to lazy, then when I access, say, class.address, that's executing another um, you know, uh, SQL statement uh, to our database, right? Uh, so because we're making another uh, database access, we should be awaiting this operation now that, we were, uh, that we're in the asynchronous world, right? So um, when I add the async adders mixin, um, I now am able to await uh, my uh, attribute access through this awaitable adders uh, property. So if I am in the, say, customer table, I would be doing customer.awaitableAdders.address in order to access the address property of the customer, and I'll be able to then await that. Um, yeah, so then, you know, I wouldn't be blocking my coroutine as I'm waiting for that additional select statement to occur. Yeah, so you can see the example here. Okay, so here's how uh, we use the async uh, session maker, the asynchronous factory. Uh, we're gonna be um, using it to update our get customers function. So again, async uh, get customers is now a protein, so it's using the async def uh, keyword. And um, when we establish a, uh, a session now, instead of using uh, asynchronous context manager, we're now using the asynchronous version of it because the statement here um, connects to the database, and we don't want to uh, we don't want that to happen synchronously. We want it to happen asynchronously. We want to give a chance for another coroutine on the event loop to execute while we're awaiting the connection. Um, and of course, when this um, async context manager uh, exits, it's also running session close, but it's um, because it's an async session. This is happening, and we've used the async with statement. Um, we're awaiting the close instead of uh, blocking and waiting for the session to be closed. Okay, um, so now my get customers function is gonna look like this. So remember, um, we've used this select uh, construct to uh, query customers, so my statement can just look like select customer, customer being the ORM. And um, here we want to use the stream scalers uh, API because we don't want to return all customers all at once. Uh, we want to be able to return them as an asynchronous generator as we've, um, as we've done before uh, adding SQL Alchemy. So here I'm using async for customer in 
I can await this because this is um, a statement that is um, contacting the database. Uh, it's actually executing my query. So I can await this and um, yeah, uh, I can then yield one customer at a time so that I don't, my, my caller function doesn't receive the list of customers all at once. Um, yeah, so, um, okay, before we look at this, I will give you some time to um, update your get customer query or function. All right, um, hopefully you've had a chance to do that. Um, we have another example here. Um, it's again, a very similar idea. We um, use the async session maker factory to create a session um, in an asynchronous context manager. Very similar idea, we're awaiting the uh, session to execute and everything else is kind of uh, the same, you know, the same um, way we've used SQL Alchemy before. And then uh, uh, finally, let's look at the insert one. So the insert statement, again, looks a lot like the um, asynchronous version. But if you remember, we'd done three operations. We'd selected a customer, we'd constructed an order and a set of order items that we associated with it. Um, and then we've added all of that to our session before we called session.commit. So now there is session.execute, session.add, and session.commit. Which ones do we actually need to await on here? If you had answered uh, session.execute and session.commit, you're correct. Uh, session.add is not actually making any um, connection to the database. Um, it's just adding basically the objects that we created into like um, into like basically session is sort of like a placeholder for your state. Um, so session.add just simply adds these objects to your state, but it doesn't actually uh, make a call to the database to insert those, uh, this data until you actually call session.commit. So it's not until I call session.commit uh, that I need to actually call await here, because this is not a blocking IO operation. Um, so yeah, so it's like, um, it's useful to kind of understand like where you're actually making um, you know, calls to the database and you're gonna benefit from uh, calling await. Uh, of course, SQL Alchemy is sensible with what it exposes as uh, an awaitable and what it doesn't. If something doesn't make sense to await, then, you know, it's not awaitable. Um, yeah, so this is basically, I mean, you can go ahead and like update the um, the insert query as well, but this basically takes us to the end of the workshop. Um, you can of course check out the last branch to see like uh, what the code would look like after we put it all together. Um, yeah, like if you have any questions for me, like we have 10 minutes, um, you know, please, um, please let me know. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I hope uh, I hope you learned something useful today. And uh, yeah, thanks. Actually, uh, one thing, we do have a feedback form. Um, so if you go to tinyurl.com slash sqlalchemy dash feedback, uh, we'd appreciate any feedback you can give us. Um, yeah, um, just any suggestions and what you liked, what you didn't like, and yeah. <laughs>